Hear me when I say this. You'll not get into your destiny, your purpose, without some aspect of change happening in your life. If you could get to your destiny where you are, staying as you are, you'd be there. All right, get your Bibles out. We're back to the book of Acts. Now that we got through Christmas, we're going to keep plowing through. And we left off in chapter 10. We're going to, uh, again, be studying and reading and finishing up, actually, the 10th chapter in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 10, I might mention, is a hard chapter to divide because it's the introduction, really, to the next five or six chapters. So, so chapter 10 through approximately chapter 15 in the book, which uh, is six chapters, actually, uh, it begins, we see the early church to wrestle over this concept of what are we going to do with these Gentiles. Gentiles, as you will recall, are non-Jews. That's the best way to define a Gentile, a non-Jew And all of a sudden, God is saving non-Jews. Now, this is a big deal. And we're going to see this to be so as we plow through these next few chapters in the upcoming weeks. There are really three themes or questions that begin to unfold in all of these chapters. And I want to just do a little introductory work now uh, as we press into these chapters. Three themes or questions that begin to unfold in all of these chapters. All of these three themes will deserve a, a message in and of themselves. So don't, don't think that I can just give you these three themes and that's the three points of the message this morning. Um, you're going to have to understand all of these things and they're all intertwined and connected. And so I want to spend uh, some time on each one of these concepts. Number one is this. What is the place of Judaism within Christianity what is the place of Judaism within Christianity now I suspect we all know that there are overlaps and there are similarities between the two faiths Judaism and Christianity the most significant overlap is that 39 of the books we all call inerrant and inspired we all agree upon and that's called the Old Testament now I mentioned this to you several weeks ago that there is a segment of Christianity we know as Messianic Judaism In other words, these are Jews, racially Jews, who have received Jesus as the Messiah. So they are Messianic Jews. If you've ever heard of the group Jews for Jesus, they would represent this group of Messianic Judaism. Now, some of these people are converted Jews that are practicing the fullness of their faith and includes the Messiah, who is Jesus. Now, there are other non-Jews, listen to me carefully. Now, I'm going I'm to spend a whole week on this. I think it'll be a couple weeks from now, but I just, I'm just giving you introductory material. There are those who are non-Jews or they're Gentiles who like to embrace the rituals and the festivals of Judaism. And they do this for various reasons. Some of them certainly, as we would, see within all of the festivals and practices, shadows and types of Jesus. For example, if you were to have a Passover meal, how many of you know that the Passover meal represents aspects of who Jesus is and what he did? So Passover is a shadow or a type of Jesus. So are the festivals, so is the blowing of the shofar, prayer practices, all of these things. And there are many Gentiles who embrace a Jewish ritual. And finally, there's this third group who are Gentiles as well, who believe that you are required, even as Christians, to do these rituals because Christianity is really a Jewish based religion. So uh, I need to spend a whole message on this, and I will talk about this because hopefully I can clear up some confusion to, as to how these two faiths interact. Uh, who knows, I might create more confusion, I don't know. But, but, but we need to untangle that, at least for you all who journey here and track with us here at Legacy. I, I want to untangle some of these things. 
So we will, we will dive into this extensively in a couple weeks. The second area or the second theme that I'm going to pick up next Sunday is the question, how does ch- the church handle racism, bigotry, and prejudice? Now, when you begin to study the Jews and the Gentiles and this interaction that's taking place beginning in chapter 10, this was more than just a religious struggle. In fact, it had deteriorated into racial hatred. We know, for example, that there was great animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. All you have to do is read through the New Testament and you will see the Jews and the Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. It was beyond a religious issue. It was a racial issue. It was a national issue. And we know as we begin to walk through the Scripture that there are moments we see these animosities or these prejudices begin to rear their head. For example, another example is with Miriam and Aaron. Miriam and Aaron got offended at their brother Moses because he married an Ethiopian woman. Her name was Sabora. Now I can assure you that that transcended their religious issues. There was a racial issue or a component that was in there as well. So next week, the first Sunday of the new year, uh, I'm going to be teaching on that aspect of this Jewish-Gentile uh, controversy, and we're going to make application with regards to the racial overtones. I honestly <clears throat> believe that this is incredibly relevant for the era and hour we're living in. And so I have some things that I'd like to say about it, and uh, I believe it's going to be a continuing topic for our nation all through 2015, and so why not just open up the can and deal. What better place to deal with these topics than in the house of God? So if we can't talk about it, then uh, we've got problems. So I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain to you the biblical definition and understanding of racism, bigotry, and prejudice. And hear me when I say this. The Lord wants to address these issues in every person's heart. All right? And we will talk about that next Sunday. And then finally, number three, the third theme, which is the one I'm going to talk about this morning, is why does the Lord innovate or force change upon the church? This is where I'm going to focus today because I can think of no better theme as we face the new year and which one I want to extract for this morning because this Jewish-Gentile controversy was one that underscored a massive overhaul of some thinking that was going on inside the early church. Now somebody said when it comes to change, the church is like a snail on the back of a turtle. I want you to hear that for a minute. A snail on the back of a turtle. What does a snail do on the back of a turtle? It screams, wee! Some have compared change in the church to exactly that. Can we admit that people as a whole do not do change well? Christians in particular do not do change well. But in Acts 10 through Acts 15, I'm going to keep reiterating this, in these six chapters, God is going to be doing some massive changes. So don't get too self-righteous as you read the accounts of all this struggle going on because I'll assure you that God will zero in and find your comfort zone and he'll call you to some change. And you'll find out that it's no easier for you than it was for them. So that's why I've entitled our message this morning, Embracing a New Season. Embracing a New Season. Now in Acts 10, I'm actually going to be working with verse 9 through verse 48. Gratefully, I'm not going to read to you all those verses. Uh, You can read them all, but they're surrounding and swirling, as will chapter 11, this incident that took place at the house of Cornelius. And so I'm going to read some selected passages to you. I'm going to explain a few of the passages, and, and so bear with me for just a moment, but open up your text to Acts 10, verse 9, and let's get started and uh, set the tone with what will be taking place these next few weeks. We read these words. The next day... As they went on their journey and drew near the city, now these were the men that Cornelius had sent out after his particular vision, it says that Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he, Peter, became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, 
he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth wild beasts creeping things and birds of the air and a voice came to him rise peter kill and eat but peter said not so lord for i have never eaten anything common or unclean and a voice spoke to him again the second time what god has cleansed you must not call common this was done and you may want to underline it if you can this was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again now while peter wondered within himself what this vision what this vision which he had seen meant behold the men who had been sent from cornelius had made inquiry for simon's house and stood before the gate and they called and asked whether simon whose surname was peter was lodging there while peter thought about the vision the spirit said to him behold three men are seeking you arise go down and go with them doubting nothing for i have sent them i want to stop there for just a moment and just tell you now as we begin to pick up verse 21 through verse uh, 33 we begin to see where peter and cornelius are sharing each other's experience and vision in other words they're having a conversation uh, cornelius is visiting peter's beginning to visit and they're beginning to they're beginning to assimilate the things that god had spoken to both of them remember god spoke to cornelius go find peter now god's speaking to peter about the coming of cornelius and they're sharing together in verses 21 through 33 in verse 34 through verse 43 peter after he has the sharing moment begins to now preach to the house of cornelius he begins to share with him the gospel begins to preach to his household and then at the end of verse 43 we get to verse 44 let's see what happens it says this while peter was still speaking these words the holy spirit fell upon all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with peter because the gift of the holy spirit had been poured out on the gentiles also for they had heard them speak with tongues and magnify god now here's in my opinion this is one of those moments and again i i usually see people get saved and then somewhere down the line they get filled with the holy spirit so normally when i teach this i teach that there's a moment of salvation somewhere down the line there's a moment of being filled with the spirit in this instance uh, that's changed in this instance it appears as if cornelius and his household both receive uh, their salvation we talked about how he was god fearing but he'd not yet come to the fullness of salvation as well as the outpouring of the holy spirit and there are times that happens to people that god will give them everything at once while i think mostly it happens one two there are times like this it can all happen at once and that's what's going on right here they heard them speak with tongues magnify god and peter answers and says can anyone forbid water because these people had not even been baptized yet and he says can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the holy spirit just as we have and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the lord and they asked him to stay a few days so we're going to talk now about embracing a new season a rather lengthy passage of scripture thank you for bearing with me and getting through all of this but we've got to set up some things in order to understand what's going on here now cornelius and his household are the test case they're going to be the test case for the early church to see how well they embrace certain things god's going to test case them on how they embrace change uh, eventually he's going to use this as a test case to see how well they deal with their judaism and eventually he's going to use it as a test case to expose their prejudices now you'll remember cornelius has already been spoken to by the lord with regards to contacting peter and now we see the lord dealing with peter in regards to cornelius and so the lord gives peter this vision of animals and these animals are ceremonially unclean and he's told to eat them because he's hungry so peter who's a good jew remember he's jewish but he's also now this christian good jew christian 
responds by saying to the Lord, no, Lord, I know these animals are here, I'm being told to eat, but we don't eat defiled animals. So the Lord responds to him by saying, don't call unclean or don't call defiled what I have cleansed. And so the vision, even Peter begins to understand, is dealing with more than just the dietary law. I, I don't have time to teach you on Levitical law, but we all know that there are certain things Jews did and did not eat. Pork was one of them, for example. So we can assume probably one of the animals was a pig in the vision. And, and, and Peter's going, ain't no way I'm eating barbecue. I don't care how this might smell. It may smell great, but I'm not eating barbecue. I'm a Jew. But the Lord says, the Lord says, don't call defiled what I am cleansing. Now, aren't you glad that God has cleansed barbecue restaurants? I just, I'm here to tell you, thank God for barbecue. <laughs> but the key to the vision wasn't that you were released to go get barbecue after church. The key to the vision was that God was speaking to him about receiving Gentiles into the church. Because up to this point, a good Jew could not even sit with a Gentile. Up to this time, you could not eat or have a meal with Gentiles. You could not spend the night in a Gentile's house. Anything that was prepared or sold by a Gentile had to be cleansed, especially with water, which is why most Jews had within their homes this barrel of water that was designated that if you bought something in the market from a Gentile, you took it home and you gave it a bath because you couldn't touch something unclean or something that a Gentile had touched. They were meticulous, Jews were, about such things. And the Jewish Christians were convinced that the Gentile converts could only be accepted into the church if, if the men in particular went under the knife of circumcision. Can you, ima can you imagine that membership class? I mean, I'm, I'm telling you. I mean, I'm just trying, it's real. This is real. Now this is going to come to a boiling point in chapter 15. They're going to get, they're going to get into a massive church fight in chapter 15. But the Lord is beginning to prepare them for these issues. And the Lord was saying that now he himself was going to be cleansing things and Peter was to no longer worry about that. Which honestly was why Peter said, how can we forbid them baptism? That's why he's going through this whole question. Because the scripture says the circumcision was saying, what's going on here? These Gentiles are receiving the Holy Spirit. They've not been circumcised. They've not been baptized. But yet they're getting born again tilt in the minds of most of the early church and and so peter says sort of amazingly he says well if all this is god's doing this sovereignly how could we deny them baptism despite the fact they've never been circumcised and let me just also say this by way of doctrine which is why now in the church our circumcision which may or may not be chosen by parents when their sons are born that will be your decision. But circumcision of the flesh is not the mark of our relationship with God. It's circumcision of the heart, which is indicated really through our obedience in baptism. So they're dealing with all of this here in the early church. And if I might, let me read between the lines of the vision because this is what God is saying. He's saying, Peter, the season is changing not only in your life, but in the life of the church. The rules, the application, the ways that you have grown accustomed to are going to be applied differently now. Why is that? It's because the cross has changed everything. I'll say that again. The cross changes everything. The cross, which represents the death of Christ, His burial, His resurrection, His ascension into heaven, has turned the whole religious system and ritual upside down and inside out. You see, the offering and the sacrificial system was changing. Why is that? It's because we no longer needed the blood of bulls and goats because we have now the final lamb, the perfect lamb, Jesus slain for us all. We don't have to go through the rituals of the sacrificial system. The cross changed all of these things and and, and, and let me just give you quick, I can't get into this a lot, maybe here in a couple weeks we'll get into it some more. 
But there'll be people who come to you and they'll say, well, if you believe the Bible, you don't do all that the Old Testament says. You still wear polyester and you still eat shrimp and you still eat lobster and, you know, you don't stone your kids when they're bad. And they'll go, yeah, 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 yeah. Hear me when I say this. All you have to do is say this one phrase to them and it's this. The cross changes what the cross was designed to change. Which includes some of those activities, which includes some repercussions. The cross changed everything. The cross was a game changer. Because Jesus became the living fulfillment of all that the tabernacle and the temple and all that took place. He became the fulfillment of all of these things. In other words, we don't have to, these things may be done for illustration, but, but Jesus is the fulfillment. My relationship is no longer with bricks and mortar. It's no longer with ritual. It's no longer with tradition. My relationship is with the person who has fulfilled all of this. Are you following me? So, no matter how meaningful rituals and traditions may once have been, They do not trump Jesus who is looking for relationship and provides redemption. Which, by the way, is going to become even more important when you get to about A.D. 70. Now understand, we're we're a long way from A.D. 70 reading here in the Scripture. We're probably around A.D. 40, 50, somewhere in there. But in about 30 years, unbeknownst to all of these Jewish believers, they don't even know this. Peter doesn't know this yet. The early church, who's mostly Jewish, doesn't know this yet, but in A.D. 70, the temple and Jerusalem will be destroyed. They aren't going to be able to do those things anymore anyway. But they don't know that yet. But they're getting set up for this. Because Jesus is going to take it all away. He's he's going to say, "I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it all away. In order that you might know that your your religious activity was never what I was looking for. I'm looking for a relationship. And the Gentiles become the perfect illustration because they're clueless about all that stuff. They just want to love God, worship God, and have a relationship with Him. But what happens here is this whole thing begets a transition. And the transition opens up the can that we call change. Now, let's talk about the nature of change. Change is never easy. There is a comfort and a safety in the routine and the predictable. That is why people like tradition. It's predictable. Now, everyone in the room that's listening to me has memories of certain traditions that are meaningful to them. And uh, there's a desire to maintain tradition. I mean, and and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing evil in and of itself until it usurps or tries to replace your relationship with the Lord. Then, Then we've got an idol. But, but, but tradition in and of itself is not evil. In fact, there's a recent New York Times article uh, that I saw that was remarking how even atheists desire the practice of certain traditions. Now, albeit God's not involved in that, uh, be, but it's interesting that they think there is some stability or predictability and feelings, important feelings that are produced in those particular uh, traditions and I guess we'll find out if that works well for atheists or not uh, I, obviously it probably isn't because the connection is here not here but this is especially so when it comes to our religion there is an appropriate place for stability and tradition it becomes a problem when it impedes the will or the word of God now let me just give you a great illustration uh, this for, for example this time of year um, Let's talk about Christmas Eve for just a minute. Now that we're beyond Christmas, I I can open this can. Nowhere in the Bible are you required, and I've underlined, required to celebrate Christ's birth. No, but no, you aren't going to open up the scripture, show me where it says you are required, you're required to celebrate, you're you're required to have a happy birthday Jesus party, you're required. You're not going to find it. Now, hear me. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, you could make a case for a lot of right things about that. It's a nice tradition. Take a moment, take a day, reflect on Jesus coming. You do realize that it may not have been on December 25th. You realize that. I think everybody pretty much understands that December 25th may not be the actual date of his birthday. It's interesting to me, for many, 
while they will miss scores of Sundays all through the year, to think of not having or being at a Christmas Eve service is heretical. I'll never forget our first year, probably two years at Legacy. You know, Christmas came about three months after we started Legacy because it was started in, in a September of 2002. So it was about th three months after our start. And, and I just personally decided after all the upheaval and tradition, we just, we just weren't going to be able to pull off a Christmas Eve service. Oh, have mercy. <laughs> I was excoriated by some. <sighs> I can't believe, I can't believe you aren't going to have... Um, Service for our king. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's, I, there's no passage that says I have to. But that's the power of tradition. It's interesting, though, the same ones that were in upheaval about no Christmas Eve. It was amazing how negotiable the other Sundays were. When we are told to meet on the first day of the week. So I would rather follow the tradition than what I'm told to obey in the Word. But I'll leave that because the Lord told them. But that's the power of tradition. Interesting. Peter even, because Peter will come out pretty well in these passages. As you'll read through here, Peter does pretty good in these passages. But I want to point several things out as we go through this. It took the Lord three times speaking to Peter to apparently get it through his head and into his heart that these were Gentiles that were going to come into the church three times. How many visions do you need to get it? Peter had at least three. And the reason I know it must have been God trying to break through some things is because Peter will be the one later on who the Bible will tell us that Paul will have to face off on with regards to his prejudices concerning the Gentiles. So even getting this vision three times does not fix Peter's prejudices. Hear me when I say this. You can be baptized with the Holy Ghost and still be full of prejudice. Peter was. Most of the early church was. They were all in the upper room at Pentecost, filled with the Holy Ghost, and they were all still prejudiced with regards to Gentiles. We'll get to that next week. So hear me when I say that you can be filled with the Holy Ghost and your heart not be perfect still. It's, it's what's happening in their lives. So in these passages, it does appear, at least initially, Peter to be taking some good steps. He appears to be the hero in this chapter as he's preaching but he will revert back to his prejudices before we get four more chapters into this. And he will be the one Paul will have to look at eye to eye that he will mention in Galatians, Paul will, and says, I had to rebuke him to his face. I had to say to his face, you've backed up on God. Now, for me, that's comforting because it shows me that even apostles can have difficulty with change. Change is something that has to be navigated, embraced, and nurtured ran across the story about a young man by the name of William Knudsen. It's 1912. William was an engineer for the Ford Motor Company, and he said that the Model T, which had been out for about four years, now remember this is 1912, the Model T had been out for four years, and, and Knudsen said that the Model T needed some updating. Henry Ford was the creative genius behind the Model T. He wasn't convinced that it needed any change. So while Ford was vacationing in Europe, Knudsen created a prototype car which changed the color to a bright shimmering red, kind of like a fire engine. And he changed the windows and he turned it into a four-door convertible. And when Ford returned from his European vacation, he was invited by Knudsen to see the prototype. And so when Ford saw the prototype, the story goes that he walked around the car three or four times. He had his hands in his pockets, kind of like I'm doing now, and he said nothing. And then all of a sudden, it's like he went crazy. And he opened up one of the doors, and they still wonder to this day how he did it. He ripped off one of the doors. And then he went around the whole car and ripped off all four of the doors. He kicked out the windshield. He ripped off the top. Well, I guess we could say he didn't like it. Well, what happened? Well, Knudsen, it said, left for General Motors, and Ford kept his Model T. 
But GM embraced the design features that Knudsen had suggested, and a number of years later, Ford eventually did change, and he created the Model A. But the only reason Ford created the Model A was because he was getting his pants beat off him by GM because he had originally refused to change. My point is simply this in telling you that story. Change is hard for everyone. Even those like Ford. Ford was a guy who led the automobile industry in creativity, but he couldn't readjust to a new revolution or a new way of thinking. There's a phrase that we use that we might remember, and it's this, the greatest critic of a new season are sometimes those who are a part of the last season. I want you to think about this. The same apostles who were in an upper room, the same guys in the upper room who had experienced that outpouring, they had received a new season. And out of that outpouring and season, they run into the streets with this new move of God. And they begin to declare it to the old religious system. And, and we've read through these passages how the old religious system began to persecute them because they were a part of this fresh outpouring, this new season that God was doing. They were the ones that were being persecuted because they were the ones demonstrating all this newness. Now they've become the very thing that once rejected them. Are you hearing me? Now let's make application. How good are you with change? Because I'll assure you, eventually you'll see your heart revealed in these matters. Now I've got to give credit to, to most of you here. In fact, all of you can receive credit here in just a moment because uh, you've been on the legacy journey and you've done remarkably well with change. Some of it we planned. Some of it we didn't. <laughs> But hear me, if God orders the steps of the righteous, then He orders change. But we all know that some don't do the change train well. It's remarkable, is it not? I think it is. I'll just say it out loud. It's remarkable to me how you can move a location geographically just a few minutes away from another location and you can throw people off. Oh my God, I've got to cross a bridge? Oh my God, five more minutes? <laughs> don't, don't tell me change isn't tough for people. But hear me when I say this, that is infinitesimal in comparison to what God was doing in the early church. We, we think somehow we'd have done better if we'd have been in the early church. Listen, this is, this is massive overhaul that was taking place. But the truth is, if you want the will of God, then you have signed up for the change ride. You can't say, I want the will of God, and think that everything's going to remain static and not change. Have you ever noticed in Scripture, whenever the Lord leads His people, especially in a moment of battle, He gives them a new strategy or a new tactic? He doesn't do the same tactic over and over again. He doesn't allow the people of God to enshrine a strategy to defeat the enemy. We're required to seek Him and to hear from Him and what it is we're to do. For example, what God did at Jericho, he, he never did again. It was never that way again. What God did with Moses, he never did it that way again. What God did with Jehoshaphat, he never did it that way again. He never repeated himself. There may have been some precepts that you could apply in there, but overall, he, he changed the tactic. He changed. Why? It's because that's the element of trust and faith that you have to bring to the equation. So let me give you the prophetic implications and then I want to share a couple things before we wrap this morning. The prophetic implication is this. Some of you have been desiring some of your situations or circumstances to change. Do you know where I'm going with this? Some of you are already in the midst of change. I believe you're coming into a year of change. I know it's always proclaimed at the end of every year, the beginning of every year, they always pastors and prophets and everyone comes out and goes, it's going to be a year of change. Well, yeah, it is. The, even the year changed. <laughs> so we know some, some things are going to change. But I just want to say to you, I, I, this is profoundly just impressed in me. I, I, you, some of you want the will of God. You, you're desiring the will of God. Hear me when I say this. There's some change coming to your life. I believe seasons can change. 
And here's the key. You can resist it or you can embrace it, but either way, God's going to accomplish it. Because change, change is what he does. Isaiah 43, 18, one of my favorite passages says this. It says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, the Lord says, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I like that because what the Lord is saying is this. For you to come out of your wilderness or for you to be refreshed in your desert, God is going to do some new things. Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared for God to do some change? You know, when something new comes, that means change. Change. So let me give you just a couple points that I'm pulling out of the early church with regards to change that we can apply in our life to help us do change, do the change train better. All right? Points to remember. Number one is this. God isn't changing. You are. God isn't changing. You are. From the earliest moments in Genesis, you can see where God's purposes were beyond a single nation. The Abrahamic covenant was not restricted to Israel alone, but it was in that covenant that the Lord said to Abraham, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So it was always God's intention to reach non-Jews. I'm going to say this again. It was always God's intention to reach the Gentile. So what looked to be this new move of God to the early church was really fulfilling what God had already spoken prophetically. The only people who thought it was new were those who forgot the big picture. So God wasn't changing, was he? But there was massive change going on in the early church. This happening that I'm reading to you in Acts chapter 10 really should not have been a surprise or some radical innovation they'd have known the scriptures as they should have they would say okay this is what god is doing he's reaching the non-jew but as is often the case we think god is changing when in fact he hasn't changed but we're expected to change i always find it interesting god doesn't change we change but how most of us are is this i'm not going to change he needs to change that's how we think it works i'm i'm, I'm here I'm going to do what I want to do, but God's going, to, God's going to yield to me. And that's not how it works. God is unchangeable, and we yield to him. He has the plan. He knows the end from the beginning. We don't. We think we do, but we really don't, which is why change is a part of the trust test. You say you trust God. We'll find out if you trust God because he will send change your way, and now we'll see. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not just not good here. It's got to be good here. Change comes when we find out that we're really going to follow the will of God. So that's number one. God changes, we don't. Number two is this. You cannot be afraid of change. You can't be afraid of change. Whenever God opens up a door or calls you to something or turns a season, it will require you to change in some form or fashion. Do you know what you, know what you call something that doesn't change? A fossil. A fossil a fossil is an animal that did not make a geological transition. Isn't that right? That's a simple definition of a fossil. It didn't make the transition. And that's what we become if we don't make the transitions. So you can't be afraid of change. Hear me when I say this. You'll not get into your destiny, your purpose, without some aspect of change happening in your life. If you could get to your destiny where you are, staying as you are, you'd be there. But you're not there. I'm not there. You're not there. We're not there. Listen, in order for destiny to happen, there's going to be some change that will have to take place. And just by way of truth in advertising, it can be scary change. Because all you see is the risk and the sacrifice that's involved. Everybody wants a destiny, but they want it while they're sitting on their sofa watching television. That's how I want Hey, if you're going to send me my destiny, here I am, man. I'm plopped down doing the video stuff, man. Send it, send it my way, Lord. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. With you you, you got to get in the video. I mean, you're in it. I personally marvel at the courage of the early colonists coming here 
with absolutely nothing to settle in the frontier. Or those, have you ever thought about those that were motivated to move across our nation westward in the early days of our nation to settle in the Midwest and the West? I mean, think about that for just a minute. About throwing it all, I mean, I guess in a covered wagon, and you just take off and you don't, you're just walking into nothing. You want to talk about having to trust God. We don't, we don't want to drive over a bridge. We won't go five minutes out of our way. We, 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 we aren't going to do anything that inconvenience us. We're just, we, we have no conception of doing the will of God. There are people I know right now, they, they, won't, they won't even go to a church they need to be at because it would entail spending 25 cents more in fuel. And we wonder why God doesn't work in our life. We have about as much trust and faith in God as, as to whatever our, our boundaries are. We are way too safe at times, which is why our lives are way too normal. They're devoid of the miraculous. The very nature of a walk by faith means that where we are at at any given moment will not be the place we ultimately entrench. And your fear or your faith will be the deciding factor as to whether you move forward in the things of God. you got to understand, this business, walking with Jesus is risky. But it's also miraculous. We want the miracles, we just don't want the, the, the risk steps that are involved in these things. We want the stability, we want the predictability, we want the comfort, we want the convenience. But hear me when I say this, that you will never see a miracle there. Never. Never. You see miracles when you act by what? Faith. Faith. Number three. Change always challenges your comfort zones. Everything these Jewish christians had everything they had understood and grown comfortable with and lived according to was about to be challenged everything they had was about to be challenged only god could fulfill his word which was thousands of years old while at the same time causing his people to think it was a new thing listen the lord has spoke to some of you in prayer he spoke to some of you prophetically. He spoke to some of you through his word. He spoke to you about what he wants to do. And you got the promise of God and you cheered. Yay! I believe God can do it. Well, I'm glad. Now guess what? There's going to be a massive change feature that's going to take place in your life because it's not, it's not coming with you just standing still. Change never occurs that way in the boundary of comfort. God change always entails some out-of-the-box moments. It's just how it works. Read the Bible. Finally, number four is this. The Holy Spirit is evidenced in that change. The best part of the story is that as God opened the door for the Gentiles to come into the church, it says here that he poured out his Holy Spirit. He poured out his Holy Spirit upon the moment to confirm or to endorse the change that was taking place. Isn't that what revival really is all about? When you embrace, listen, I just give you simple concepts here. Repentance means what? It means to change, right? To change your way of thinking. So, so if you repent, let's say revival, God wants revival, repentance is entered into, and all of a sudden that change takes place, what does he do? He blesses that with an outpouring of his Holy Spirit. God opened the windows over Cornelius' house when he and his household embraced a new season. And that's the pattern or template that God uses. When you're responding to his leading and embrace the change that he's producing in you and around you, that's the place the Holy Spirit is poured out. So if you ever ask the question, why hasn't God moved from me? It could be because you haven't moved when he asked. Because as you walk in faith, that's where God, that's where God becomes obligated to open up the windows of heaven hear me when i say this you can believe the right things but god's not necessarily obligated to open up the heavens it's when you walk by faith then he sees the walk he sees the fruit he sees the activity of trust and that's when he begins to pour out his spirit and he confirms that which he wants to produce inside of you now i'm going to wrap with this 
It's a great story I ran across as I was studying this week. It's about Chuck Yeager. Many of you have heard his name. He's known for being a famous military test pilot in the 1960s. He tells the story of flying a jet and deciding to buzz a friend's house that was on a lake. So what he did was he dropped his jet down to approximately 150 feet, turned it upside down, and as he was trying to buzz his friend's house, his aileron locked into place. An aileron is, is one of the features on a wing which uh, keeps the airplane from moving side to side and of course helps its lift and, and other things. But the aileron locked. And when the aileron locks, I mean, that, that's not good. So without panicking, which Jaeger was known for sort of his cowboy ways, he didn't panic. But he let off the G's and he pushed up his nose and, and he was able to, to break out of it and climb to a safer 15,000 foot level. And so he did the maneuver again at 15,000 feet. And the aileron stuck again. And so when he was able to come out of it and, and he landed the aircraft, he reported the incident and found out later that four previous pilots had died in crashes under similar circumstances and the engineers could not figure out what was going on that was causing uh, these aircraft to crash so he gave the report as to what stuck and what took place and so once they had his report they were able to run down what was taking place and they found out that one bolt had been installed improperly apparently there was one man in the assembly plant who ignored some of the new instructions on the assembly of this jet this one bolt was to be installed head down according to the engineering but the man knew that bolts were never installed head down but rather heads up so instead of obeying what the engineers requirements were he decided he would go ahead and install the bolt heads up rather than heads down he wanted to do what he'd always done instead of respond to the engineer who was asking him to do something different. And that one bolt caused four deaths. Jaeger would later say nobody ever told the man how many pilots he had killed by refusing to follow the engineer's change on that one bolt. Now most of the change you and I will face probably will not be that massive with regards to life and death, but it may well be the life and death with regards to your spiritual vigor and victory. Sometimes it can be just that one thing. I'm just going to keep doing it that one, my one thing I've always done. I've always done it this way. It's just, I'm just, the, it, listen to me, you start locking into that and you may well crash. But if you'll allow God to speak to you and talk to you, it's amazing what can happen if you'll just allow the Lord to encourage you with a little change, what he can begin to do in your life, even in the life of a local church. How many of you know there are churches who've been doing it the same way for years? And God bless their tradition. There's nothing evil about the tradition. Nothing, nothing wrong in the sense that somehow it's, it's evil, but, but there's, there's no freshness, there's no life, there's no spirit, there's no nothing. And they're just slowly entering into death. I'm just, I'm just sharing with you. It works that way not only in churches or businesses. It works that way in your life. It works that way in every area of life. God wants to bring change. So embrace, embrace the season. And as we switch one year and we move into another, I believe that's what God's saying. He's saying it's a new season. Embrace it. I mean, do you really believe God wants to do something new in 2015? I mean, stop and think about that. All of you, if I would have asked that to you as we started this, I, I believe every head would have bobbed in this, in this room. Yeah, I want God to do some new things for me in 2015. I, I do. I believe there's some promise that needs to come my way in 2015. I believe the Lord would like to show himself in a, in a special, maybe miraculous way in 2015. You would have bobbed your head. Now hear me when I say this as you're bobbing your head. Get ready. Change.
change. You can embrace it. I would encourage you, embrace it, and you'll see God do some amazing things.